Finance Committee and turn it over to the chairman who's uh, <laughs> late. <laughs> Chairwoman, I'm sorry. Chairwoman. Chairperson. Chairperson. Well, it's on the sheet here. It says chairwoman. Okay, we have one item on the agenda for Finance Committee. It is a resolution amending the 2023 budget for the Springdale Police Department to supplement the implementation of the Arkansas Full-Time Law Enforcement Officer Salary Stipend Act of 2022. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little out of breath. And this will be presented by um, Police Chief Frank Gamble. Thank you. Yes, uh, if you guys will remember last year, I came to you and asked them in the budget for 2022 to allow us to receive stipend for all our full-time officers at the Springdale Police Department. Uh, this Act, Act 224, requires that we come back to council and amend our budget for this year. We had six officers that received the stipend right at the end of last year, and they weren't able to get the checks cut uh, through payroll until January. So those six officers are included in this amendment to change the budget. And also there's five officers that just recently graduated the academy that we're applying for the stipend for them as well. So the total change in our budget would be uh, $59,207.50, and none of that money will come out of the city budget. That's all coming from the state. Move the resolution before the recommendation for approval. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to forward the resolution to council with recommendation for approval. Any other questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Okay, that closes the finance committee. We'll open up the ordinance committee meeting. We have one item on the uh, agenda, and it's a uh, ordinance to be presented by the uh, chief of staff explaining why the uh, citizens of Springdale should be continued to get ripped off by not having competitive bidding and... Uh, and uh, provide preferential treatment for certain services. Well, I'll try to explain the correct <laughs> version of that. Well, <clears throat> uh, the state of Arkansas allows municipalities uh, the opportunity to uh, procure uh, professional services. And so we're wanting to amend our ordinance to create a new opportunity to make purchases <clears throat> that are significant large purchases for the city. Um, one thing we realized when we were doing the solid waste uh, contract is that um, there's really not an avenue for uh, municipalities that don't have experts uh, working on staff in certain areas, just like we didn't have expertise in solid waste. There's some purchases that cities need to make that are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, that we don't have experts on staff to know, uh, you know if we're getting a good deal. And we found that just because we buy something on the buy board doesn't mean it's the best deal either. It's not the cheapest deal. In fact, we bought our fire, uh, some of our trucks for the fire department, the pickups, uh, we got a better deal than was on the buy board uh, by looking at prices. So we've worked with the Arkansas Municipal League and we wanna add to our professional services a procurement consultant and whenever we find a, a purchase that we need to make that's significant, we want to be able to bring in someone's expertise just like we did with the solid waste contract. Um, what we're going to propose in these contracts to this procurement consultant is that we're reimbursed just like we are on the solid waste contract. Uh, let me give you an example of how this would work. <clears throat> this is a real life example that happened last week here with the city of Springdale. Um, we've been getting some quotes on a, a project that we're wanting to do in the bond, and uh, I won't go into detail on what companies they are, but uh, we got part of our quote uh, for some turf was going to be north of $800,000. So I called someone I know that is very familiar with turf uh, and got, the, got a different quote from the same company, and it ended up being just over $400,000 because they have that buying power. Um, so that shows you we could save three, maybe $400,000 by going this direction. What they'll do is they'll go in and do an RFP, uh, uh, request for proposals uh, through various companies like turf companies, and then whenever we select the one that's most beneficial to the city, uh, that procurement consultant will walk us through that entire process, and they'll make sure that we're getting exactly 
what was in the RFQ or the RFP. Um, they'll it's kind of an advocate uh, that will protect us to make sure we're getting exactly what we want to pay for. And uh, at the end, if it's not the cheapest and we'll have the ability to waive competitive bidding, if we feel like something will last us longer and bring us a greater value that way. Uh, so that's what we're proposing is to change our ordinance uh, so that it will allow for procurement consultants. Um, and I think it's going to save the city millions of dollars. Is there a is there a limit to like a, a cap on an amount of a project that we would use these or is it just by the type of project or is it is it dependent on how much a project is? So the this could also be not just for uh, <clears throat> for buying certain items but also like we we have what we call an EAP an employment assistance program. It's a contract that we pay every year. And we're wanting to put that out, and we're, we're going to use somebody that understands um, EAPs to put this together for us. Um, I don't, that one's not going to be significantly uh, a high number. We usually pay about ten dollars to $12,000 a year for that. Um, so we could use it for small projects like this, or really what I'm looking at using this for is larger purchases uh, to see if there's better deals out there but we need to use somebody that's a professional in that industry so that we're not just buying off the buy board all the time and assuming that it's the best deal let's let's talk about your turf example for a minute that we ran into part of this would also be the ability to write the specs that park staff may not have the ability to do yeah and and so it's a it's a it's a advisor so that we're sure we're getting a good we're specking a good product that is going to serve the serve the city the best. Yeah, when we first started talking about turf, um, we sat down with Chad and the guy said, "Do you want coconut bead? Do you want rubber pellet? You want?" And he went down the list, and we all looked at each other and said, "We have no idea." Um, and he said, "We'll all sit down and meet with you and find out all of your needs, what you're looking for, and we'll get the best warranty, the the right stitching. There's a pitch rate, a, a spin rate, an infill." Those are all things that nobody on staff is an expert in, and we really need somebody to come in on our behalf that can walk us through and make sure we're getting what we need and, and what we paid for. So um, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for this. So anytime we make a larger purchase, we, we want to look at the option of using this service. And it, it, it's actually a tool that the statute gives us that has been underused, in my opinion. I think the last time we designated something a professional service was in 20. 11, 11 mm -hmm. when we designated appraisal services as professional services. It's, so we have engineers, architects, uh, engineers, architects, appraisers, and I think land surveyors are the things that we have designated, but the state allows for more categories. We're actually creating a category, uh, and the municipal league is on board with this. Uh, we ran it past Lanny and John Wilkerson. They love the idea, and they think it's going to save cities a lot of money. <laughs> but we'll be the first ones to do it. Move ordinance passed, recommended for approval. Second. Uh, any further? Uh, I'm just mesmerized by his presentation. <laughs> I've never understood how we could get ripped off so easily and make it sound so good. Any further? Yeah, any further discussion? All those in favor of this ridiculous ordinance, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, Opposed, same sign. Uh, unfortunately, it will be uh, forward to the council for recommendation for approval. As always, we appreciate your strong, unbiased support. Oh, no problem, Mayor. Glad to serve. Does anyone else have anything to come before the Orange Committee? <laughs> <laughs> if not, I guess we stand adjourned temporarily. Well, <clears throat> it's hard to follow stuff like that, but I'm going to go ahead and open up the, the police and fire committee. Uh, Chief, can, is there any way we can top that? I, I don't know. <laughs> Not going to try. <clears throat> Chief's going to talk to us about our risk assessment standard review. Yeah, so our accreditation is on a five-year cycle, and as part of that process, our, we're up for reaccreditation. Uh, this spring uh, and we'll go before the, the board in August uh, for that reaccreditation 
hearing, part of that process uh, is that we have a current and updated risk assessment and standard of cover. And so I'm gonna turn this over to uh, Chief Dustin McDonald, who's our uh, compliance and accreditation officer, and he'll uh, go over the, the contents of our risk assessment standard of cover. And then if you've got any questions, we'll be here for that. I promise this is the, the 30,000 foot view. I'm gonna try and be as quick as possible to get through this, but um, what you have in front of you is basically a detailed assessment of the risk we've identified um, for fire, EMS, technical rescue, and hazmat, and uh, what we've accepted as our uh, standards for the coverage for those services and the support services that go with them. Um, the accreditation model requires that everything we do is mission driven based off our mission statement. Uh, our mission statement is to save lives, protect property, and minimize, minimize the effects of, the emergency, of all emergencies in the city of Springdale. Uh, the purpose of this standard to cover again is to help identify a proper service the city needs and improve those services currently provided through reducing response times ensuring appropriate staffing and providing sufficient appropriate equipment. Um, what we're looking for is are we sending the right apparatus? Are we sending the closest apparatus? Are we sending the right number of people? Are we sending the right number of apparatus for an alarm? Should we only send one unit? Should we send more units um, for, a high, for a large fire or things like that? And, you know, not, is it, not only is it a benefit from a cost savings, but you know, it, it, if we were to send more apparatus than we need and if somebody was to get into a wreck and hurt, um, that's definitely not the image we want to portray. So. The accreditation model has 11 different um, categories that we go through. Govern and, governance and administration is how well the department works with you all. Um, we have a great working relationship. That was probably one of our easiest categories to write. Uh, the assessment planning is part of our standard to cover and our risk assessment um, and what we deem uh, the department's needs are based off of that. The goals and objectives, that's our strategic planning. Financial resources is where we deal with how we use our money. It's pretty straightforward. Our support services, uh, community risk reduction program, domestic preparedness, um, that's a, a big part of it. Ironically, when you get into the accreditation model, um, the fire, EMS, technical rescue, and hazmat parts of it, and firefighter mentality, it's pretty straightforward for us. There's not a whole lot of stuff that we write to. Uh, the 254 performance indicators, I think 12 of them are related to those categories. The rest of it is how the city and the department work together. So uh, physical resources, our stations, our apparatus, our protective equipment, things like that. Human resources, again, one of the larger categories is how we're working with our people and uh, the city's working with them. Training and competency, um, our essential resources, our relationships with the water department, um, with dispatch, our administrative services and our IT department. And then our external relations, our mutual automatic aid agreements. And then the new big one is firefighter health and safety. And um, that's a, a major push they have. but. Uh, parts of the risk assessment, the city and the department history. Um, we go through our goals that we've accomplished over the last several years and, and show how we work with the city. Uh, we do a detailed description of the area characteristics and the programs and services. Uh, we take into account the community feedback we've gotten through surveys and through meetings with citizens and with the department members. Our goals and objectives um, that we've established out of the standard strategic plan, um, our current deployment and performance, we'll elaborate on that here in a minute, uh, and our critical tasking that we require for the incidents and current deployment evaluation, plan for maintaining it, and all the good stuff at the end. Again, I apologize for 300 pages. It's not ideally uh, what I would like to give you, but that's all the data that they require in there. So. Um, 
the city history, um, department history, station locations, significant department events. Um, the main thing is the characteristics, um, the topography, the terrain, the climate, and how that affects our delivery of the emergency services. Um, the programs and services we evaluate, our fire suppression, our EMS, our technical rescue, uh, risk reduction division and disaster preparedness is again a new, uh, not a new push, but one of the big pushes the commission's going for right now uh, due to the, the, the way of the world, it seems. Um, our training, our logistics and accreditation, those are all, we're all support services to the main mission of the department, which is fire EMS tech rescue. Uh, community feedback, we've gotten feedback through, like I said, the surveys we sent out, uh, web-based survey. We've sent out sur surveys to department leaders, getting their feedback is what they expect from the department. What do they, you know, is acceptable response times? What would they like to see the department do moving forward? Um, a complete strength witnesses or strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats analysis. And we incorporate all that into our strategic plan, um, which we go through and edit every year and um, publish all that's published on the city's website. So, uh, <clears throat> one of the things we identify through the risk assessment uh, department, risk the department faces, we break them down by our FMAs. We're actually going FMAs or fire management areas for uh, clarification. I apologize if I throw the lingo out, but um, right now we have nine FMAs, we're actually gonna break the risk assessment down into further quadrant areas based off of our CAD. Um, but it just gives, each little area has its own individual um, characteristics. Um, station eight, real heavy industrial area. Station four is very residential type area. So we, we try and identify all that. We break them out, down into four risk categories. Um, low risk is the stuff run of the mill, not much is gonna happen on those types of incidents. We usually respond non-emergent to those. Uh, moderate, a little bit increase. Maximum is where most of the stuff you guys hear about are structure fires, um, large EMS events, things like that. And then our high special would be uh, commercial fires, large technical rescue, large hazmat events and things like that. We identify them based on the inference coding system, um, which is pretty simple and straightforward. We give, they give us a series of numbers that we can categorize each type of those incidents in, and it's pretty straightforward as far as how they fall into EMS, tech rescue, fire, and things like that. So we identify our target hazards in those areas as well. The main thing we look for is critical infrastructure. Um, anything with a high loss of life potential, you know, large gathering areas, hospitals, nursing homes, uh, any major loss of property. Um, you know, we've had two pretty significant fires in the last few years that large, large loss of property. Loss of income is one of the things, you know, if we have an industrial complex that catches fire and is out of service, you know, we, we take into account that people are going to not have jobs temporarily. The, we're not going to have the tax base and things like that. And um, any type of incident that might deplete department resources, if we have to send two and three and four alarms and having to draw our neighbor, neighboring departments in to, to help cover the city. Uh, like we were talking about, um, for our risk levels, you can see the angles here. The low risk um, fire side, we have passenger vehicle fires, you know, trash fires, things that require a single engine. Um, structure at moderate risk would be outbuildings, things like that. We generally don't have to have what we consider a full alarm assignment, which is four engines, a ladder truck, a medic unit, and a battalion chief. Um, those reserved for the maximum risk are residential structure fires, our basic commercial structure fires. Um, and then our high, high special would be fires and identified uh, target hazards, large commercial fires. And with our CAD capabilities, we're getting where we can really um, drill down on what some of those risks are. And uh, just showing we take into account the past five years of data um, based on uh, 
Council of Incidents, and these are the inverse codes we were talking about, and these are strictly the fire codes. We take that into account, and that's part of our frequency analysis. Same with EMS. Um, moderate's where you guys see us at most of the time on the road. Um, you know, an engine and a medic unit. The maximum is when we have larger, you know, multiple vehicles, you know, um, different things like that. And again, you can kind of see where we're at the last five years. Uh, general medical, un unfortunately, that's the way it clumps in on there. But trauma is a big, uh, trauma and behavioral are big, showing big trends throughout the city um, and increases. And I, don't see that changing anytime soon. So that's something that we're looking to just kind of address. The big thing out of the standard of cover is our total response time. Um, there's four different elements in, that go into that. Um, the first due unit and effective response forces are terminology that we use to obviously to get the first unit on scene that's capable of starting the mitigation and then the effective response force is all the units that we have on scene for uh, to complete the mitigation of the incident the, the four engines the ladder truck all that the call the elements of that response time the first part is the call processing time and that's when dispatch picks up the call takes all the information goes through the pro qa line of questioning and then tones us out and then the turnout time is when we get the alarm at the station or through locution when that gets going and from then until when our units mark responding on their iPads. And then the travel time is from when they mark responding until they get on the scene and then that factors into the total response time. And the, the accreditation body measures the total response times for the first due and for the effective response force. And we do that for each level of risk for low, moderate, maximum, and high for fire, EMS, and uh, tech rescue and hazmat. And we go through that and we measure to the 90th percentile. Um, so what our acceptable rate is, I'm trying to, I missed a slide here, but the 80th percentile is our benchmark standard. So. Our, our 90th percentile is if we were to have 10 calls, um, nine of those times we make it out in under 60 seconds for our turnout. That's that 90th percentile mark. We don't use averages because in the fire data analysis world, averages can get thrown off if somebody's in a rig and goes responding. That's technically not a, uh, a accurate measurement of what we're looking for for turnout times. And there's so many different factors that the 90th percentile is a lot more accurate for, um, for our data collection. To establish our benchmarks, which is our goals that we're trying to meet for that, we use an 80th percentile method that adjusts year to year. So whatever our 90th percentile time is, the 80th percentile time, which would be less, excuse me, um, is what our goal is moving forward. And that's a dynamic goal that will shift every year um, depending on where we're at on that. So, uh, part of what we're looking for is our critical tasking for these incidents. Um, this is just an example of a maximum risk fire incident. Um, what amount of personnel we will need to complete all the critical tasks that are required for an incident. Um, you have our battalion chief is our command and scene size up. You have our initial fire attack units, which would be two personnel. Our pump operator would be that third person on a, the first engine. You have your secondary attack lines, water supply, our rapid intervention. You can see it just kind of snowballs into 18 people for a scene, and that's where it's our responsibility to send the right apparatus and the closest apparatus to, um, to these types of incidents. We talked about the 90th percentile. Actually, I apologize. I had slide get flip flop there. Um, but if you look at our maximum risk fire suppression right now, um, you can see in 2022, these are our, the far column there, our numbers for getting an effective response force on scene. Um, and, and we evaluate with the accrediting body, um, 
we talk with them frequently about what's some of the trends and uh, things like that that they can offer their opinions on to help us out. And they do evaluate us um, for any major changes or anything like that. So, almost the end. Um, out of that, we established our goals, what we, what we found out in the risk assessment, what we found out in our standard to cover. We established our goals out of that. And again, established our benchmarks. And through the strategic planning, we developed our compliance strategies, which we review these times monthly. Um, we're looking at changing our records management system to where we can have almost instantaneous um, updates on this. Instead of having to do it on a monthly, we can just at the click of a button be able to look at that. But, um, and then again, communicating these expectations to you all, getting your approval, and then it's just a continuous circle that we go through every year and every five years as a whole. So that, so I tried to tried to make it brief. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions off to the side. I don't want to uh, draw draw it out too long. So, Dustin, when do we like? I know uh, Chief said in August. I know y'all will be there presenting. Right. Uh, when then do we find out how long does that process usually work? So the peer team will be in Northwest Arkansas uh, June 11th through the 14th. Um, we take them around to all the department, all the stations, the water department, and um, discuss, and, and they do their assessment of what we've gone through. And from that point on the, the 14th, we'll either get the recommendation for, um, you know, a deferral or for if they recommend us for accreditation. And um, at that point, we'll go in front of the, the, the hearing at the commission on August 30th. I was going to send you an email today because we just got the official schedule. Okay. Um, but and that's where they'll do the the hearing, like you went to in Dallas with right. us, and we'll know know for sure then. So okay. It's getting down to it. Thank you all. Thank you. This is very involved. Like all right. I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. I'm going to make a motion that we move the resolution to council with recommendation for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second to move this forward with recommendation for approval. Thank you guys for your hard work. Really appreciate y'all and all of our fire department. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. It will be moved forward. And I will close out the police and fire committee. All right. We've got a couple of items uh, that we've listed as committee of the whole. Um, can I can I move mine table mines for two weeks from tonight? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I'd like to table my discussion for Lakeview and Deering Road traffic studies for two weeks from tonight. Okay. Do we need a? We don't need action. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. And then we've got a discussion on the update to the form based code. These, now, let, let's go ahead and start out clearly. This, this is what's going to go to Planning Commission. That's correct. Uh, this is merely informational. If you guys and gals have questions for me, I'm just going to go through some of the more major points of what is being updated in the uh, form based code. Planning Commission comes out, comes out of Planning Commission, we'll come back to count. That's correct. We'll next that next Tuesday, Tuesday, I believe that's May 9th. For adoption. Yes, for adoption. <clears throat> so you're just going to kind of hit up hit the highlights of what changes they're going to be considering, right? Absolutely. Let's see. So um, some stuff is just kind of cosmetic. Um, there were a couple spots in here where we had one story and 15 feet, and that was very confusing and really didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so we changed that to uh, one story or 15 feet, and that's for your ground level. <clears throat> Uh, we've included things like a row house and courtyard row house and uh, your building envelope standards. And so this kind of diversifies the options available to property owners and developers. Uh, we've made some changes to the parking lot requirements as a result of a focus on walkability and the intention of working toward uh, parking structures downtown as outlined in the downtown master plan update. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, we've included a cottage court special overlay district. Uh, it's much like some of the other updates I've referenced. This will diversify the development options of property owners and developers, and we have at least one uh, looking to do this upon passage of this update. So we're pretty excited to see that come together. Um, <clears throat> there will be in those uh, courtyards uh, specific spacing between the structures and will ref uh, require fire department approval. And piggybacking on that um, uh, reference a moment ago, uh, page 333 in, in your packet there, of, or I'm sorry, rather the form-based code portion of your packet, uh, we've got private drive standards and site layouts that, again, those will be uh, oftentimes deferred to the planning or the fire department for their call. And then finally, in terms of signage, uh, pages 4-57 and 4-58 outline sign standards based upon the nature of the district, meaning residential, campus, mixed use, and so on. So if you have any questions, I'm more than welcome to answer those, or I can be sure to get you those answers uh, tomorrow. On, on uh, Emma Street and, and Main Streets, uh, down through there that, that commercial structures are on and okay. and specifically retail. Yes, sir. On parking, what do we have any uh, any rules or anything about the residents parking in the in in front of commercial buildings um, during business hours? Um, I think that's more that may be more of an earnest question off the top of my head. Do, do you know, do we have anything specific that would prevent uh, a resident from parking in front of a business? There's been some discussion about yeah. Yeah. The, the city would have the right since it's a city street in front of a business to limit parking to those businesses only, but I don't know if the substance of those conversations have been. There might be something going forward that might... Well, we've never had residential on top of commercial, and now we're having that so you know i know in front of the cake shop they've got you know this is just for loading unloading or whatever she's got up there but you know i, I i've been hearing about residents of the building parking in front and maybe taking up spots that the businesses uh would like to have open and i don't i don't know what that looks like but right. That is one of those things that will be uh, addressed with parking structures because there will be opportunities or more opportunities at that point for people to be able to park in the structures as opposed to directly in front of uh, the commercial outlets as they are now. Would you think it'd be beneficial to look at like during business hours, these spots are, are reserved for the businesses and then after that, then people can park there kind of like... That, that's an option. Mm -hmm. I mean, we it's kind of like there's no place to quit when right. I do that. The, what we've done in front of Shelby Lens, we did it years and years ago when they were about the only right. business going down here. And they needed a way to load. Now, that block's going to all be done differently with the redevelopment of first security property. So I don't know that those are going to need to stay, but we'll just have to, some of this stuff we're just going to have to deal with as we need to. Now, the, the property, like the the apartments over here that have the like on top of Bellas, mm -hmm. uh, there was some confusion I think on, uh, on some of the residents' part that they were being told some things that weren't right. Uh, but they do need to fill up. We we told them they need to fill up the parking that's built as part of that project behind before they park anywhere else, mm -hmm. and. You know that we're just going to have to kind of monitor that and make sure everybody's going to have to play nice together as this downtown grows and is parking but as rick said we're looking for opportunities to uh, uh to create some parking structures over the next several years and that's part of the downtown master plan yes sir and uh so as those come online it should help alleviate some of that I don't want to ever get into a paid parking situation, or a, and I know y'all don't either. And uh, uh, but at the same time, we've got you, you mentioned as part of walkability. And, yes, sir. You know, that, that desire and how that how that plays into parking. You know, we've got a lot of good parking downtown, and I think we just in 
our minds, we think if we can't get real close to the place we want to go right to, front. right in front, then, we don't, then there's not enough parking. When really, the same person would go up to the promenade or to Northwest Arkansas Mall and park and walk blocks and blocks to get to their, and, and we've got a lot of parking. Close, well, as, well, at least that close to anything they want to go to downtown. So part of it's just getting that mindset that that we do have a lot of parking, but we we need more, and we'll continue to work on more. I know there are a lot of opportunities as we look at the bond issue and some of the improvements we want to do uh, specific to downtown. We've got a lot of wide streets with a lot of opportunity for on street parking, on street angle parking that can get us get us a lot of extra spots downtown. So uh, west part of Emma. Meadow Street is real wide. A lot of opportunities there. Hotham. So, so if we do get people asking, who who do we need to direct them to? Asking, asking about about parking in front of their business and all that. How does that go to traffic, we'll, or does that we'll go? We'll consider, to, but I, I'm I'm going to be real hesitant to do anything about that. I think because once you start, there's not a place to quit, and and I think I think people just ought to. To park, and, and but but I, I do think if there's an apartment building somewhere, they need to take care of uh, they and it, their parking needs to be filled up first. Yeah. And we've not been seeing that happen. I think my biggest concern is that if somebody leaves their car there for four days and on Emma Street right. in front of a business, you know, that's, if, if something like that happens a lot, we're going to have to address that, okay. and we'll have to address that whether whether it takes a uh, some sort of change in what we do. Police will have to address that. Yeah. I wish I had a better answer for you. Yeah. We're, we're going to grow into this just like, you know, it's going to be new to us. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to adjust on the fly. Sure. Yeah. Anything else for Rick? Okay. Thanks, Rick. When will that come? If, do we know how long? I think we need to do a two hour decide everything, or they going to consider everything Yeah, they're, they're supposed to decide everything. I'm sorry. So it would be the second meeting, second council meeting before it comes back to the first. It would be the, the first, and unless there's a need to push it to be the second. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay
on the 27th. 27th. So if it's a resolution. I get you. And I hate to nail everybody down. You never know when somebody could get sick or whatever. But we can also have a Zoom option. For mixing bonds and trash here. I yeah. talking about trash right now. We're talking about trash right now. Trash would be a resolution. Bond is resolution. Okay. So, so if we go to committee the Monday before, what would, what would that be today? If, if, the, if the council meeting on the 27th, it'd be on the, 20th, be on the 19th, right? So it would be Monday the 19th. Will we be ready for that? If it's just a discussion, we should, uh, in theory, have all that lined out by that point. But will they have the results of the committee's recommendation? Uh, yeah, the committee will have the recommendation okay. by that point. So that could that would be enough to discuss in the committee. Yeah, because we'll we'll have the final scoring done. So whoever wins the final scoring, and that'll be that'll be I think the first week of June, we'll have that done. Okay. So. Uh, we should have time to bring that to committee on the 19th. Okay. So the big question then, I'm talking about trash again, is will we have will we have a quorum on the 27th? We know three will be gone. Uh, I just checked. I was on vacation, but I, I'm, I'm not leaving until the 20, 29th of my sergeant. Okay. So you can be here. So oh, five could five pass a resolution. Right. Four plus nine. Well, four plus nine. Yeah, because we, we have somebody coming in from Texas on this deal, so we yeah. we would need to. That's yeah. the AAA dead week. That's why everybody's right. traveling. Right. Is everybody else okay as far as you know? Sounds like Sounds like for the 27th? Jeff, as far as I know. It's a tough day. That's why I had to <laughs> Okay. We can Zoom if we have to. We can Zoom. Yeah. That's an option for any of you. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but uh, and I don't know, Brian, if you'll be where you can, you, you'll be able to zoom too if necessary. Okay. I'd probably zoom. All right, if y'all can zoom, well, you need to do that anywhere. Okay, well, that's it. So we'll, we'll move ahead on the 27th with the trash. Have you, have you gotten to talk to Chef or Bob or Kevin about what that would do to us on our bond ordinance? I think we've, we've got a lot more flexibility, but if we can zoom, we should be okay for the ordinance so too. That doesn't necessarily have to go to committee because people would have voted and y'all know what it is. It's just, it's just an ordinance to allow us to sell the bonds yeah. on that. But it is an ordinance, so we'll have to have six to do it with the emergency clause. Okay, well, that, that tells us what we needed. Yeah, we can right. still proceed the same way. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. So early voting is this week, right? Early voting starts tomorrow. I have no idea. Uh, I have no idea. Well, it'll be like 2 a.m. there. I think it's just, just, uh, well, I'll be in the it, it changes. In Springdale, I think it starts out at uh, at the American Legion building, right? Is that right, Frank? Okay. And it's there for a couple of days, and then it moves to Elmdale, I think. County Clerk's Office, early voting begins Tuesday, May 2nd from 8 to 4.30. Um, the American Legion starts Tuesday, May 2nd, 8 to 4.30. Um, it ends on the 4th at the American Legion. Um, let's see. Elmdale Baptist Church, early voting is Thursday, May 4th, and Friday, May 5th, uh, 8 to 4.30. Okay, so Tuesday and Wednesday in Springdale is at the American Legion building on the corner of Johnson and Spring. And then Tuesday, on Wednesday, Tuesday and, and or on Thursday and Friday, it's at Elmdale Baptist Church. Yes. Okay. And the county clerk anytime this week That's right. uh, in Fayetteville. Mm -hmm. um, Anna was looking into that this afternoon. She had a question on that. She called the uh, Washington County election, or Benton County Election Commission, and they didn't have an answer. So uh, I don't think they ever found that, did they, Ernest? Weren't you in there? Clear the oh. You got to go to the Benton County Courthouse to vote early. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. No. Ben, do you have an update or is it the same? We're still operating under open uh, May 7th. May 7th. We, we hope earlier, but May 7th is the date we committed to try to make 
Now that won't open Holcomb where it's torn up, right? right. That's That'll right. be it. Right there in front of those businesses. Yeah. Okay, good. Now the contract itself, the whole contract won't be done until late June. So that may be when it's where it is. Okay. And that'll that covers the Holcomb part. So okay. Boy, it's looking great. Hey, Mayor, uh, yeah. I, I see Mike's not here tonight, I don't think. But um, a couple of months ago, I had asked someone to look into those signs there on on the interstate. Yep. And I don't know what's taking so long to get back on that. Uh, he gave an update. They just said he was researching it, said it's complicated, been going on for a while, and there's been some lapse dates. Mm -hmm. et cetera, so. Is everybody familiar with the, what I'm talking about on those signs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, I am they look like billboards, yeah. kind yeah. of. I, I don't know if it's a billboard or a, or a yeah. sign or what, but. I got the impression that there's uh, some of the permits have lapsed that they've gone ahead and uh, put them up anyway. And I think there's a reason. I don't know. Okay. Well, can you ask? We'll try to get an answer. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll have him reach out to you. Attorney can discover that for you. Somebody, yeah. Okay. I'll just review the. Yeah, I'll make sure he follows up. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All right. Thanks, everybody. Yep.